back to the Zero Hour. I'm your host, Richard R.J. Eskow. Over the last several months, we've been covering the unfolding developments in Pakistan, where in February of this year, we interviewed former Prime Minister Imran Khan. Uh, Mr. Khan and his party are seeking to regain power uh, after losing it uh, last year uh, in a series of maneuvers we could go into again at some point. Uh, now there is uh, there are some new developments of case, including the arrest and conviction of, of Mr. Khan, who is facing many charges when he was on the program. That, that total count of charges against him, I believe, is in the neighborhood of 150 now. And he was arrested and convicted over over the weekend is currently imprisoned. My next guest has co-written an article shedding some important light on the history, or uh, what may be extremely relevant history regarding Imran Khan's current plight. Murtaza Hussein is a uh, is a politics and excuse me, national security and foreign policy reporter for the Intercept. He and Ryan Grimm. Uh, have just published the other day uh, an article entitled headlined secret Pakistan cables uh, cable excuse me documents US pressure to remove Imran Khan with the subheading all will be forgiven said a US diplomat if the no confidence vote against Pakistan Prime Minister Khan succeeds which as we know uh, it eventually did so without any further ado, Murtaza Hussein. Welcome to the Zero Hour. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Uh, well, it's a pleasure. And please tell us a little bit more about this story, how it came to pass, and what we should know about it. Sure, sure. Well, you know, over the past year and a half, uh, Mr. Khan has been embroiled in a very serious political crisis. All of Pakistan has been embroiled in the crisis uh, because of the issue of Khan's removal from power by his political opposition, working at the behest of the very powerful Pakistani military. Now, Mr. Khan has alluded and mentioned directly many times the existence of a secret a classified Pakistani cable document known as a cipher, which showed evidence of conversations between US and Pakistani officials, wherein, as he described, uh, the U.S. side, the U.S. State Department, encouraged his removal from power, uh, which eventually took place last year. So, you know, uh, yeah, uh, quickly. So, you know, this the existence of this cable has been the subject to a lot of debate and a lot of uh, arguments and conspiracism inside of Pakistan. No one ever seen it before, but this week we published at the Intercept the entire text of the cable, so the public could finally see what it really said. Are you able to tell us anything about how this cable came to be in your possession? In the story, there are some details of uh, how we received it, and that's actually the whole story of it. But effectively, we were contacted by a um, figure inside Pakistan's security establishment who was disillusioned with the impact of this crisis on the military and the politicization of the military and the level to which the Pakistani public itself had uh, soured on the military military because of its moves against Khan and perceived interference with the democratic process. So with this motivation, this source leaked this document to us and provided it to us. And that's how we came to obtain it. Currently, Imran Khan is being blamed by the government for leaking the document. But the reality is that neither Khan nor anyone in his party or any civilian was involved in this. It was someone from the broad Pakistani military establishment. And that's an interesting facet to this story, Murtaza, because, uh, to me, because uh, the military, as you mentioned, has enormous power in Pakistan, and as does the national security establishment, the ISI, and so on. And it suggests that there are, at this point, at least a few discontented people there, or that there is some element of division in the military and national security establishments. Am I right about that? Certainly, certainly. I think that, you know, if you keep in mind that Mr. Khan is the most popular politician in Pakistan, and, you know, I'm sure that extends to many American file members of the military, but also even among those who are not necessarily supporters of Mr. Khan, uh, there is, you could say, discontent with the way that the military has moved against him, put him in prison even, 
because they know how much the Pakistan people like him generally. And they know that if they're seen as being responsible for his removal, uh, that's going to look poorly on them in the, in the eyes of their own nation. So I think as a result of that, there are these fissures inside the Pakistani establishment, what's going on, and about the crackdown not taking place against Khan and his supporters. And this comes, as I understand it, in the history of, uh, of Pakistan, a history in which over the last few decades there have been several military coups, but my, my understanding is that the military, which as you've said, has enormous power there, has uh, until recently been, rev been viewed somewhat favorably by the public, that, uh, you know, obviously there are people who disagree with their authoritarianism and so on, but that uh, this, is, my impression is that this may be the first time when the military has found itself in a situation where what it, it's doing is so deeply unpopular. Uh, am I right about that? Yeah, so, you know, in Pakistan, it's commonly said that the only really fully functional institution is the military, a public institution, because it takes up so, so much of the national budget, uh, because, you know, it has these inherited uh, internal structures of meritocracy and so forth. It's a vehicle for many middle class people to get ahead in society, where a society which is often gen generally very stratified. So, you know, had a good reputation and also it's a nationalistic society and the military for that reason. It's often popular, no different from the United States and other places. So, you know, it is very popular, but now there's a huge division because Imran Khan is also very popular. And Imran Khan, ironically, his initial political rise was supported by the military, but then we fell out with them. They're hoping for him to be a puppet, basically. I think that's a fair word to use of their own policy. And eventually he began to break with them on several important issues and they want to discard him. The issue is he'd become very popular. He'd become very genuinely and organically popular among Pakistanis. And I think that for the very large number of Pakistanis who support Imran Khan, now the military has emerged as his number one antagonist. Uh, that certainly creates a very stark problem and certainly creates a problem for the military, which is bleeding popularity and legitimacy by the day at the moment. And Murtaza Hussein, let's talk a little bit about the immediate uh, motive behind the meetings documented in this cable. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. I think it had something to do with Ukraine, did it not? That's right. So, you know, it's interesting. This cable has been discussed around a lot. It's been like referenced and passages have been cited or it's been summarized. We've never actually seen what the cable said and what it was about. So effectively, in March of 2022, there was a meeting between uh, some State Department officials and a Pakistani ambassador to the United States. And the whole subject of the meeting was effectively about Ukraine. And the State Department was very frustrated about what they described as Pakistan's aggressively neutral stance on the Ukraine conflict. Now, Mr. Khan had not, not taken a side per se, given sp speeches saying that he's allied He's friends with America, he's also friends with Russia. He's friends with everybody. He doesn't want to take, be part of an alliance effectively. The U.S. wants uh, Pakistan to be part of an alliance. And this State Department official, Don Lu, he expressed very strongly his frustration with this neutrality. And then he went a bit further and he said, if Mr. Khan, you know, at the time there was a no confidence vote already being mauled in the Pakistani government and military, if he survives this vote, it's going to be very bad for Pakistan. It's going to be isolation, quote unquote, for Pakistan if he stays in power. If he's removed from power, there will be, quote, all will be forgiven if he's removed from power. So he laid out two scenarios where it's the most powerful country in the world, which already has a very strong influence in Pakistan. If you have a certain leader, it's going to be very bad for you. And if you get rid of him, it's going to be very good for you. So I think that the military was already soured on him and they were considering getting rid of him but then they got not just one green light but like five green lights from the u.s and you know in these countries when the militaries have very strong political roles and influence in the united states the u.s is like a member of the governing compact of the country and if they don't give the green light people are not going to make big moves like that they got a green light from donald Lou in very uncertain terms uh well completely clear terms and then they moved. And if had the State Department said, we have no view on Pakistan's internal politics, that's your business, that would be one thing. Or if they'd said, 
we don't want you to remove him, let him finish the rest of his term. That also would have had an expected result. But they said pretty much a 180 opposite of that. They got very involved. They outlined some threats and some promises regarding his fate. And then very critically, in the summary section of this document, like I've read many different intelligence agencies documents at this point, it's pretty common that you have a summary for the person filing the document. The ambassador himself said that this represented an unwarranted and uh, unacceptable interference in Pakistan's development, the, the domestic politics. So it was seen even at the time as something which was uh, quite unwarranted on the Pakistani side. So that's exactly what, what it contains. And uh, the consequences have all stemmed from that conversation. Murtaza, your beat is national security and foreign policy. And, uh, you know, occasionally you hear one here is the United States uh, foreign policy establishment and, you know, which bleeds into the national security establishment described in almost um, uh, I'm trying to think of the right word, but certainly uh, pejorative and negative terms. Uh, and it almost seemed to me, reading uh, your article with Ryan Grimm, that in this case, at least, uh, you had a U.S. government that was behaving almost cartoonishly like a bad guy. In other words, you know, kind of uh, gangsterish. Uh, it could go real good. Nice little country you got here. It could go real good for you if you play along or God knows what could happen if you don't kind of thing. It really looks to me quite bad for the United States. Am I misinterpreting something here? Well, I mean, it's interesting because oftentimes people act as though the United States is not engaged in real politics and they, that they just only are guided by liberal values and that's all there is to it. And it's like so weird because if you even say that it's not the case in public in the United States, a million people will attack you and say, no, of course, what are you talking about? We don't do anything like that. We don't bully other countries or do regime changes or coups and things like that. But clearly they do. They do. The whole history says that they do. And even to the present day, they do. They interfere in other countries' affairs. And they do not prioritize or act on the basis of promotion of democracy in other countries. Because if they did, they would not be silent on the crackdown and democracy not taking place in Pakistan, which we're all seeing play out day by day by the military, uh, then I wouldn't be supportive of it de facto as they are right now. So, I mean, it really depends on your starting premises. If you assume that they engage in stuff like this all the time, I guess you could say, well, that's just what they do and what's the surprise. But for the great majority of people, I think, to this day, they believe in a great sense of innocence on the part of the U.S. role in the world. And for that, for them, it could be a rude awakening. It could be something they have to fight or deny or what have you. Um, so I would say that, you know, I don't have, I would say I have a relatively, I would say realistic view of U.S. foreign policy. So I'm not surprised to see them engaging in real politic. But I certainly think it flies in the face of their public messaging. And they also effectively have been some degree lying about this to the U.S. public because the U.S. government has been asked about this many times. They've said we've never expressed any preference about Pakistan's domestic politics. It's obviously not true now. It's not true. And in our story, we asked the State Department, they said, well, even if what's written in this cable is true, because it's a Pakistani document, we can't confirm that, and that doesn't mean we're expressing a preference. Was that, we're not putting pressure, even if we're saying nice little country you got there. So that's really the extent of their argument. And I think that uh, people can judge it for themselves. Right, right. In other words, when we said nice little country you got here, we weren't suggesting we do anything to it. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, okay. And I think the naivete here, I think a lot of it, frankly, is shared by Democratic voters. I'm just going to say that because this is a Democratic administration we're talking about doing this. And one of my concerns, I guess, uh, besides the obvious one of uh, you know, the democratic rights, sovereignty of other countries and so on. One of my major concerns here, as always, is that real politique as practiced by the United States government, we've seen time and time again, is not all that realistic. In other words, uh, 
the United States may act on what it believes to be, I think it was Henry Kissinger who popularized the term, meaning, you know, we'll be pragmatic in terms of what's in our interests, not, uh, you know, uh, um, starry-eyed dreamers in terms of ideals, but even when one thinks in those rather ruthless or cold terms, I'm concerned that many times in the past that hasn't been the case, see, for example, Iraq, but as well in Pakistan, I think now you have a situation where, and of course, uh, all this is leading up to my asking your thoughts about this, but you have a situation where you now have a country deeply fractured, you have a popular politician in jail, you have the arguably the most stable institution in the country now in the center of controversy and, and certainly uh, antagonizing segments of the population. It doesn't seem to me that even if you leave aside this sort of uh, what appears to be hypocrisy in terms of talking about democracy and so on, uh, it seems to me unwise in terms of the future stability of a country, Pakistan, that is very much in our pragmatic interests, see, remain stable. Do, does any of that make sense to you? You know, I think that I find in terms of foreign policy, oftentimes the interests of small groups of people in the United States, small groups of elites, get falsely conflated with the national interest. And they conflate it with the national interest on their own. So there are segments of the American elite which prefer a Pakistani military junta for their own purposes, as opposed to a democratically elected Pakistani government, which is more messy and complicated to deal with and may choose to be neutral in foreign conflicts and of siding with them. So, you know, in their interests, maybe having a military power in there is better. For the interest of average Americans, I think most of them would prefer to just stay out of Pakistan's business. They would just prefer to focus on their own well-being and being a good example of a strong economy and democracy at home as opposed to overturning other people's democracies and economies but even then like i don't think that it's really in the average american's interest to see country of 250 billion people uh, thrown into chaos all the possible negative externalities about that anti-americanism uh migration uh, unwanted migration or destabilization and violence a lot of things can happen. So I don't think that it's really in America's interest to, to be doing this. I do think that it could be in the interest of some people in D.C. who may see it as beneficial to them that the musical chairs of power in Pakistan settles one way or another. But I agree with you. I think that, you know, some very skillful people are used to conflating their own what's best for them with what's best for everyone. And that's just simply not the case. In what way would it be best for these people we're talking about well if you look today uh pakistan was previously neutral in the ukraine conflict now it's emerged as a major arms supplier to ukraine brokered by the united states so the united states procurement officer has been going to pakistan buying huge quantities of arms and delivering them to ukraine pakistan's a major arms producer so a lot of shells a lot of uh, hardware is now turning up on ukrainian battlefields as a result of the fact that Imran Khan and his stated policy of neutrality has now been uh, cast aside as a result of this effective you know, coup, you could call it, by the military organized with his opponents. So, you know, I think that's changed significantly. And I think that if you look at it in the terms of the long-term relationship between the Pakistani military and the U.S., the military in Pakistan has always tried to make itself useful to, to America. They During the Cold War, you know, they tried to make themselves useful fighting the Soviet Union. During the war on terror, they tried to do the same thing again. And now those eras are more or less over. In this new era, they're trying to figure out how they can be useful to, you know, to America. So now they figure out, well, we can give them arms and we can give them who knows what else uh, beyond that uh, to help them with the new geopolitical rivalries. In return, we'll keep the spigot of American money coming. We'll keep maintaining this warped political economy where the military dominates the economy and Pakistan dominates the political scene as well, too. And, you know, for these two segments of these two respective societies is best for the Pakistani people is obviously not good for the american people it, they're either indifferent or i can pick an argument it's not in their interest either and you know the game continues and let us remember and i and, and, and you know better than i but just to remind our audience we're talking about i think the fifth most populous country in the world we're talking about a nuclear power that uh, borders um 
Afghanistan, Asia, and another nuclear power with whom it has military tensions, India. So instability in Pakistan is a disturbing prospect, to say the least. You know, another dimension of this that's striking to me, Murtaza, is that uh, is that Ukraine was the the trigger for all of this. The fact that once we decided to go down the road of uh, military support for Ukraine, and I, you know, we don't have to get into all discussion about who did who to what first, but we can. But I mean, uh, you know, my point being, as soon as we decided to emphasize the military approach in Ukraine, military interests once again swamped, seemed to swamp, since you cover both foreign policy and national security, it, it, it has struck me that the military priorities, especially regarding Ukraine, seem to have overwhelmed whatever momentum was there for diplomacy as a priority in the U.S. government that we saw, uh, uh, we've seen military uh, military interests predominate over negotiations with China. We've seen it uh, in, in different parts of the world. And it strikes me as if this is maybe another symptom of an imbalance. I, I, to me, it seemed as, at times as if the State Department was acting more like an arm of the Pentagon in terms of its public utterances. Perhaps my impression's wrong, but my impression has been that particularly since the escalation of conflict in Ukraine, that uh, diplomacy has not been a popular or powerful motivating force for this administration. Am I being unfair? I think that's a fair characterization. I don't think that this administration has seen many major diplomatic successes in Ukraine and between Ukraine and Russia. You know, there's not any appetite right now now for a diplomatic settlement. It may change after this Ukrainian offensive comes to an end. It seems it has not resulted in any major changes in the battlefield. So that may, may result in a change in the negotiating strategy going forward. In the Middle East, I don't think the administration has brokered any significant deals. Uh, they're trying to build on the Abraham Accords now, which you know remains to be seen if that will continue. But no, I would say that's a reasonable characterization. And you know, I don't know, diplomacy, the State Department has a lot smaller budget than the Pentagon. So that manifests itself in some pretty obvious ways. And I think one way you see it is militarization of foreign policy, which has been an ongoing problem and it's continuing today. And it looks set to continue well into the future. And this Pakistan episode, I think, is even an example of that because it's prioritizing military needs in the short term over political engagement with a very large country, which is inevitably going to be important due to its size. And Imran Khan, in response to all of this, and I was struck by this when he came on this program, I know he did an interview with The Intercept as well, and of course, uh, as appeared on other outlets, I was struck by the directness with which he challenged the military. As you mentioned, the military uh, were supportive initially of him. Perhaps they assumed, you know, celebrity athlete, it would be easy to manipulate. I don't know. But uh, I was struck by, you know, he named a general. He said, this is the guy I blame. He survived an ass assassination attempt in late 2022. He implicated the military in that. He was directly taking them on and yet at the same time he was oddly for me oddly concili conciliatory toward the u.s itself as it's as if he was trying to find a place for himself where the u.s would not be entirely uncomfortable seeing him return to power and yet at the same time he was very bold about challenging the military do you have any thoughts about that you know, ultimately, despite the American role in greenlighting what took place in Imran Khan, it's actually the military, which is the actual people who pulled the trigger and removed her from power. It wasn't like Operation Ajax in the 1950s with the U.S. just figmented the whole thing out of thin air. There was definitely some reason for him to be removed anyways. And it could have happened anyways, too. No one really knows. It's a counterfactual, even without this very strong express and consequential, in my opinion, a U.S. encouragement. So ultimately, for him to get back in power, he needs to be on good terms with the U.S. They can't, if they hate him so much and they have so much power in, America, in Pakistan, they're never going to let him come back. So he needs to have a de facto positive relationship with the U.S., or at least neutral. And even before he was deposed, he was not like he was 
anti-American person. So he just said that, we, he said in a speech, we're friends with America, we're friends with Russia, we're friends with China, we're not part of alliances, we're neutral. So he wants a neutral, non-aligned foreign policy, which means not giving America everything he wants, not being completely in America's camp, but having cordial relations, economic relations, diplomatic contacts, and so forth. That's what he seems to want. And, you know, ultimately, if they're powerful enough to edge him out of power or at least influence the military to do so, they could be part of the, the at least the U.S. buy-in will be required for him to come back at any point, too, if you take that privileged place in Pakistani politics uh, for granted. I think that's something fair to do. So, you know, it's not surprising he's trying to be conciliatory now, but now he's in prison, so who knows? Right. Chance again, yeah. And uh, I was, uh, you know, I, I, I've been thinking about him. He's a fascinating figure to me in many ways. And uh, uh, one of the reasons I got the interview with him uh, very early on was apparently he was very impressed that I was the head writer for Bernie Sanders in his 2016 campaign. That interested him, and he presented himself as kind of, uh, he said, uh, you know, there was a kind of a, I don't want to say, it was well, the social democrat vibe to the way he was presenting himself this time around, including with me. And he talked a lot about following the example of the prophet in terms of creating what he called an Islamic welfare state. And it, it was an interesting populist left almost left populist i would say left populist presentation without being a hard left um and i'm not sure uh how deep that runs in his politics or in his coalition i get the sense that maybe his his party is made up of different kinds of people from different kinds of groups do you have a sense whether his movement has an ideolo specific ideological tone like that or not you know, it's interesting, like, uh, I think that's a relatively fair characterization of what his politics would be like for an American audience, I think it's pretty good. Like, left, he's in favor of social spending, but it was also quite nationalistic, too, so it's not, uh, like, leftist internationalism, it's something a bit different. But, you know, right. this is my own personal take, and to be honest, the story is not so much about Imran Khan's politics, per se, or even casting a judgment about them, you know, people have strong feelings one way or another, but I would say that, uh, you know, he's somebody who's definitely prizes Pakistan's independence. That's like a very running theme mm -hmm. in his commentary and the sense that Pakistan's independence has been impugned by outside forces. And if he did a poor job managing the economy or a poor job managing even foreign relations, you know, most Pakistanis should say he should be voted out. He should be voted out by the people who vote him in and we should vote somebody else in and then we change our mind later, we can vote him back in. No one wants a military dictatorship to establish itself, throw the president in prison, maybe even execute him in the future. It's not entirely impossible. Uh, that's the thing that is the most egregious, irrespective of one's views of his particular political orientation. And his party, I don't really know what the beliefs are beyond the fact that, you know, his own role. He seems to be a very important aspect of his own party, and without him, you know, the ideology could be much more flexible, could be much more flexible, much more fluid. So, but I think it's less important. It's less important than the fact that he was the sovereign prime minister of a country, an independent country, and his, uh, uh, his country's sovereignty was meaningfully impugned upon. Well, I'll give him credit for this. I have to assume there was a Gulfstream jet sitting on a tarmac somewhere for the last six months get uh, fueled up and ready to take him to london uh you know the first time he said he would accept exile and he hasn't now he's in prison so he, he he's certainly shown that personal courage i guess the last dimension of this i've been thinking about a lot i've been reading up on hindutva the uh, you know the philosophy of indian prime minister modi which i think you've correctly to me in my estimation compared to uh you know islamism of the uh muslim brotherhood for example but uh uh and worthy of further study i've been reading up on it but but uh here we have the u.s despite modi's uh less than fully democratic or communitarian impulses getting closer it seems to me getting closer and closer to india in any number of ways and i wonder to what extent 
the that realm of superpower power politics affects what's going on in Pakistan too. Fear that the U.S. will get too close to India, or you know, is the U.S. planning to play one against the other? Are, do you have any read of any anything going on there? They're very anxious about. It. They're very anxious about the Pakistan being left out of the game if the U.S. closes up too much to India. Modi was in the U.S. recently. Got a very good reception. Uh, the Pakistani military is now going to be left out of that. The Pakistani establishment is very anxious about their view, how they're viewed in Washington, to put it lightly. So I think that's a very important context to all this as well, too. And, you know, one thing I will say, just to, you know, to tie it back up the cable as well, too, the cable, the cipher document talks about U.S.-India relations, too, and talks about how the ambassador, the Pakistani ambassador, is complaining that, hey, you're giving so much pressure to us about our stance on Ukraine. India is neutral, too, on this conflict. How come they're not getting uh, flack about it? And the U.S. official effectively responds, yeah, we think that India is going to change its stance later on once their students get evacuated from Ukraine and so forth. And that never happened. But I think that there is a uh, a sense that there's a double standard in how India and Pakistan are treated uh, vis-a-vis the U.S., which makes really antagonizes the Pakistani side. But, you know, I think that, you know, it's true, and I think that the U.S. doesn't seem to care about Hindutva either. It's a communitarian aspects and necessarily undemocratic aspects or illiberal, illiberal aspects at the minimum. It doesn't seem to be too bothered by it. It's not bothered by lack of democracy or liberalism in Pakistan either. It cares about its interests. And if that's the case, let's dispel with this uh, false narrative that something else is going on here. Well, uh, we're going to keep watching. It's certainly interesting, and I know your story has had major impact around the world. I'm seeing it covered everywhere. So congratulations for that. Again, my guest has been Murtaza Hussein. He is a uh, national security and foreign policy reporter for The Intercept. His new article with Ryan Grimm is headlined Secret Pakistan Cable Documents, Documents, excuse me, U.S. Pressure to Remove Imran Khan. So. So, Murtaza, thanks for the great reporting, and thanks for coming on the program. Thanks for having me. A pleasure. And we'll be right back after this. I'm Richard R.J. Escal, and this is The Zero Hour.